Chase, will you say opening prayer? Yeah. Um. Nope. We're gonna leave that one. If it likes to. We can skip Dr. Master today. Really? Okay. Well then. You just need it, please. Music shares Brett. Opening prayer is Chase. There's no doctor in last week. Personal share is also Brett. And closing part is going to be Jake. So let's see. Make it, answer it on deck, and be here now. So who's on deck? So on deck is R is tomorrow, Holly is Thursday, and Asher is Friday. And answer it. When have I felt unequal to the task, but rose to the occasion anyway? What happened? Okay, moving on. Um, what's happening? Today's Tuesday, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, Tuesday, track has an away game. JV lacrosse has an away game. Wednesday, girls tennis versus girls pass at four. Home. And... Yeah. Anything else? No? Cool. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Oh. Okay then. Brett. Right. Okay. Right. Okay. Right. Okay. Right.
Thursday. I thought we could uh, come to seminary and quiz us that we can have a good day and that we can look for each other things and know us that we can count each other and say things in your discuss. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Welcome back. Yeah. It's been like days. It was like days, yeah. Okay, Brett. Okay. So, um, this morning, I didn't have it prepared yet, so I decided to just go to a random conference talk, but then something funny happened. So, I I just went to all the conference talks and then like scrolled through with my eyes closed and clicked on a random one, <laughs> and then, but I did that uh, two times and I didn't want to do the first two, but then the third one was, it was kind of a funny coincidence because it was exactly what we were talking about yesterday. Mm. So, yeah, it's a story. It's by Bonnie L. Foskerson from the April 2016 conference. And she says, she shares a story where her two-year-old son had uh, pneumonia and had to be flown in an emergency helicopter to the primary children's hospital in Salt Lake City. And she was really worried and she, uh, but while she was flying, she flew over the, the Draper Utah Temple and then a thought came to her, you believe it or not. And then um, she thought that she knew it, but she wasn't sure if she believed it, which I thought was interesting because that's kind of like the opposite of what we were talking about yesterday because we were thinking that like believing it was easier than knowing it. And in this story, she's questioning if she believes it when she already knows she knows it. And uh, the spirit confirmed to, but it says, the spirit confirmed to my heart and mind the answer I already knew. I did believe it. And then she said a prayer of thanks and she knew that uh, whatever was gonna happen was gonna be okay. And she knew she was gonna see the sun again, no matter what. And the sun recovered from that, so that's always nice. Mm-hmm. It sounds like her, her little crisis of faith right there was, um, do I actually believe God is here and knows me and knows this situation, knows this problem, and that no matter what happens, things are going to be okay? It sounds like she had to be okay with losing her son. Mm-hmm. Isn't that it? Yeah, it sounds pretty tough. Yeah. Um, Elder Holland gives this really great talk uh, about healing because a lot of people, like, how many have had a priesthood blessing of physical, like, where you're anointed and blessed for some kind of healing? Who has not had that experience then? By raise of hands. Okay, you've not been sick or had and, and been given a blessing to. I'm not saying have you had a miraculous healing. That's not the question I'm asking. It's whether or not you've had a priesthood blessing to of healing. And a lot of times it doesn't seem that it turns out the way you thought or wanted it to, right? I was blessed to be healed and then I wasn't. Or do I have the faith to be healed? And and what Elder Holland says is, do I have the faith not to be healed? Have you heard that phrase before? Do I have the faith to not be healed? Do I have the faith to not get the answer that I want? And I think that's the question that this woman, uh, Sister Oscarson, is asking herself. Do I really, 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 really trust God that he's got things under control? Um, and often you don't come to that moment unless you're in a moment of crisis when you really do have no power over the situation. And then you have to surrender it all to God. And do you really trust that he's, he's got it? 
Uh, maybe you haven't been in such a crisis in your life, but chances are pretty good that life will have a way of offering you that kind of a growth experience, sadly, as sad as it is. Um, very good. Thanks, Brett. Appreciate that. Um, well, I am actually really excited today. Uh, I asked our two, we have two seniors in here, right? I asked our two seniors to prepare um, something to share with us. And, they, and it's been like a few days and we've been like pushing it off because of other things coming up. So today is the day we get to hear from Holly and from Grant. And I've asked them to teach us or preach to us, we'll say, about um, the calling of apostles and prophets in the New Testament and in the Old Testament. So I gave Holly the New Testament, I gave Grant the Old Testament. And there are um, a number of callings extended. Um, and so we're going to give our attention to first Holly and then to Grant. Yep, and to um, do what they want to show us what the scriptures have to say about this. And you can, you can sit in your chair where you want, you can come up here. What do you what do you want to do, Holly? Sit right there? Yeah. Okay. Um I'm feeling that Grant is gonna do all more particular. This is also type You have your notes. Okay. <laughs> it's all up here, she says. <laughs> I don't know if it's I'm... up there either, but <laughs> uh, um and it looks like is Bridget the only one we're missing today, I think? And so she'll be watching on Zoom, so I'm gonna make sure this is capturing what you say. Okay. Um, cool. Uh, so in the New Testament, like Brother Jones was saying, there's a lot of accounts of Jesus calling his disciples because it seems like once he starts his ministry, he has to go around and he has to find people who are going to follow him and are going to help him um, as he does all of these things. Um, so the first ones that I think all of us are pretty familiar with um, that I want to just talk about for a little bit is the calling of Peter, James, and John. Um, and I'm sure everyone's heard the story. Um, but basically, you know, they're fishermen out on the ocean. Um, I don't know what ocean they're on. They're out in the ocean somewhere. Um, sea of Galilee. Sea of Galilee, mm -hmm. yeah. And they're fishing, and they're not catching anything, and they're all pretty frustrated. Um, and then they see this random guy on the shore that tells them uh, to cast their nets to the other side of the boat. Um, and that doesn't really make a lot of sense, because I don't think that the switching sides of the boat is going to do much, you know, if we're talking about just worldly things. Um, but they put their nets in, and they take their nets out, and their nets break, if I'm if I'm correct, uh, because it's so full of the fish. And um, they're all super surprised, and they get back, and they talk to Jesus, um, and he tells them, um, well, he invites them to follow him, and says that instead of fishing for fish, they can be fishers of men. Um, and that, I think, is the one everyone's pretty familiar with. Uh, but the next one I hadn't even heard of before, and uh, this is what I think is a little bit more interesting, um, is the calling of Andrew. Um, so Andrew, he's just a guy doing his thing, um, and John the Baptist, uh, as we've learned, um, is pretty involved with uh, testifying about Jesus, um, and him and Andrew are standing around, and they see Jesus, and John the Baptist testifies of him and says, this is the Son of God, you know, this is our Savior, this is the Lamb of God, um, and Andrew and another guy who's with him um, are a little confused. Um, and Jesus asks the two, what seek ye? Um, and they ask, which seems a little strange to me, uh, where dwellest thou to Jesus? Um, and Jesus invites them to dwell with him um, and teaches them. And Andrew decides to follow him, which seems kind of like a strange series of events, but I guess it worked out. Um, then moving on from there, I was talking about Philip, um, who there's not as much of a story there that I could find. Um, but Jesus finds him and tells him to follow him. Um, but what's really cool about Philip is that Philip is the agent of someone else coming to join Jesus. Um, because Philip is talking to one of his buddies, Nathaniel. Um, and Philip says, we have found him. We have found the Messiah. We found uh, the one that the prophecies had talked about. Um, and he's from Nazareth. And Nathaniel's kind of funny. He says, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? I'm not super sure about that. Um, but Philip says to come and see. And I wanted to read the scripture here because I think it's interesting, um, the next thing that happens. Uh, it's in John uh, John 1, I mean, it's verse 47. I'm just going to read a little bit. It says, Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and saith of him, Behold an Israelite indeed in whom is no guile. Nathanael saith unto him, Whence knowest thou me? Jesus answered and said unto him, Before that Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. 
Um, so Nathaniel is really confused why Jesus knows who he is, but Jesus knows. Um, and it says, Nathaniel answered and saith unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God, and thou art King of Israel. Jesus answered and saith unto him, Because I have said unto thee, I saw thee under a fig tree, believest thou? Thou shalt see greater things than these. And he saith unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Hereafter ye shall see heavens open, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Um, and this, I think, was really interesting, um, because Nathaniel sees that Jesus knows him, and immediately believes, and immediately uh, testifies of who he is. Um, and Jesus says, you know, is this really, you know, is this really enough, just the fact that I knew you, um, for you to want to follow me? And he says, you're going to see a lot better things. So it makes me think, you know, in our lives, if we're willing to follow him, based on maybe just a little bit of knowledge we have, maybe just a little bit of belief, um, we're going to be able to learn a lot more um, as we keep going. And then the last calling is not so much the calling of like apostles, it's the calling of um, a rich young man, which is I think a story that a lot of us are also more familiar with. Um, he isn't an apostle, but basically, as I'm sure you guys are um, heard, the rich young man comes up to Jesus and asks him, how do I inherit eternal life? And Jesus lists off the commandments, you know, don't steal, don't kill people. And he says, okay, great, I'm doing that already. Um, what else am I supposed to do? And then it goes on, and my gospel library app just quit, so I have to relook <laughs> <laughs> where the scripture is. Um, but in Matthew 19 is where it's giving the story. Should we um, turn there? If you guys want, I found it though, so I can okay. just read it. Um, yeah, and verse 21 says, this is what Jesus is responding to him. He says, if thou wilt be perfect, go and sell what thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Um, so this sort of made me think about if Jesus told that to me and said, you know, sell all that you have and quit worrying about the things that you think are super important and come and just follow me. Um, I want to think that I would follow him, but also looking at the natural man inside of me, um, I wonder if I would also just leave sorrowful because of the possessions that I thought were really important. Um, and the end of that chapter ends with what I wanted to end with, uh, which is a promise that Jesus makes um, to the people there and also to us. This is verse 29 in chapter 19, and it says, And everyone that hath forsaken houses or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for, nine, but for my name's sake shall receive a hundredfold and shall inherit to everlasting life. Um, so I guess just to go along with all these callings, I mean, you know, we might be asked to do some things that feel uncomfortable, or that don't make sense, or that we don't actually want to do. Um, but we've been promised that when we give things up that um, we want to be chasing rather than the gospel, uh, we can have those efforts um, multiplied a hundredfold. Uh, so I'd encourage you guys to think about things that you might not be giving up. Um, and also I wanted to encourage myself to do so um, that might bring you more um, help from him. So it is in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Holly. Well, there's a lot. There's a lot in there. There's so, so much, so many good things. And you did a great job of summarizing for us. And I didn't give you a whole lot of time to, but um, well done. You pulled out some really great points. Um, so let's pause and just think for a second about Holly's question. Because it seems that Jesus, when he calls us, uh, he's asking us to give up something for something better right and i think to to the same point that brett was making with his share uh do we really really believe that by making the sacrifice that obedience requires will there actually really be something there or will we just miss out is it is it really worth it to leave your nets. What did leaving the nets mean, Holly? What what did that represent to them? Their entire livelihood and everything that they were. I mean, that's the only way they were getting food and money and everything. Yeah. It's how they identify. It's like I am a fisherman. It says what I know how to do. This is familiar to me. It's how I get money. It's how I support my family. It's a family business. Um, I have my boat. That's no small thing to actually have a fishing vessel. It's expensive and it takes a lot. So he's not asking a little thing of them. He's asking them to give up their entire way of life. 
to just follow somebody they don't even know yet. So what what are might we be being asked, and it's up to the spirit to whisper to you, to me, what lack I yet? What is the next thing I need to do? In the last few days, I've been getting a message that I feel like I need to um, I need to work on that next percentage. I need to work on discovering what is the next thing that I need to change about myself to receive greater light and knowledge, to come closer to Christ. I know there is, and, and I'm feeling something missing, and I am working on that. And, and I want to encourage you too, also, because in so doing, there is more abundant life to be had, more joy to be had. Awesome. Anything else to say about that, Holly? You good? All right. Thank you very much. Grant, All right. take um, us to the Old Testament. So in the Old Testament, it's a lot, a lot of like Jesus interacting with them, except for the exception of uh, Moses. It's like the rest of them, it's just kind of like a vision or maybe even a dream. And it's more them trying to convey the spiritual like aspect of uh, what they experienced during that. So, where did those come from? Where did the vision, where did the dream, where did that experience? Who curated that? Well, in some of them, uh, it was they were just saying a simple prayer and um, they have this vision. And then um, other times, like, uh, I remember which one, it's probably not good. Um, but they were just walking along and they just heard the voice of God telling them to do something. So I um, guess I'll just start at the top here. So with Ezekiel, it says that he has visions of God. So I don't know if that's like multiple visions or just like one or if it was just, I don't know. But I just thought it was interesting because it said visions because it's like not everything just happens all at once. Sometimes, sometimes you get bits and pieces of that. So, mm -hmm. And God tells him that he's been called to teach the wicked people um he's commanded to study the scriptures and he is told that israel will not listen to his words which i thought <laughs> was like part of his calling was like hey no one's gonna listen to you but i want you to go do it anyway which would be really hard to do um because i don't know you feel like you're just being set up for failure mm -hmm. and that's not the easiest thing to do um in verse 14, it says that he went away in bitterness. Um, and uh, he went away in bitterness in the heart and of his spirit. Uh, but the hand of the Lord was upon his shoulder. So it's interesting because you'd think if you're like angry and bitter, then the Lord's not going to be with you. But it says that he had his hand on his shoulder. So it's like God was still there with him. Um, it then says that Ezekiel sits in shock by a river for seven days, at which point um, an angel appears before him, or the Lord, I guess, appears before him again and tells him that he is now a prophet, and if he got, doesn't go and do what he's called to do, the blood of the Israelites will be on his hands. And after this point, he's like, okay, I should probably uh, do what you asked me to then, and he starts and does what he's told. Um, moving on to Isaiah. <laughs> that, that's a really interesting story there. Yeah. So, like, he gets called, he gets this responsibility, and his emotional reaction is... He's, he's mad. Yeah, he's like, no. Why would I waste my time if they're not going to listen? I don't want to do this. So what does he do? He's like, I'm out. Sits by a river. I'm going to go, I'm going to, I'm going to escape. I'm going to take, I'm going to go rest. I'm going to do what I want to do. And God is like, it was still with him, even in his emotional human reaction to what it was. God was still there near him. He let him have his little tantrum, didn't he? Okay, you can go sit by a river for seven days. Good. I'll let you do that, but I'm not going to let you do it forever. I'm going to try again with you, sir. Right? And then he calls him, but then he gives him like, and if you don't, <laughs> yeah. it'll be problems for you. 
Um, Good, thanks. So for Isaiah, it also he had he also had a vision, and but I feel like in this vision it was it says he was led by angels to the throne of God, which it's always interesting in the scriptures hearing people describe visions because they're never like exactly the same, and I just think like I don't know it'd be super cool just like have being escorted by these angels to like the throne of God, so I thought that was, that kind of stuck out to me. Um, he recognizes that he is small in the sight of God. He is forgiven of all of his sins, and the Lord asks who he will send. And Isaiah says, send me, I will do your work. Um, God then calls him to teach the gospel under the city. Um, until the, until they're no longer, until the city's no longer wicked or until he dies. So I feel like that would be another hard thing. I feel like to be called until you die because you're like it's just such a big burden and such a big task but um Isaiah was was uh he volunteered for it too so it wasn't just like he was like unlike Ezekiel where he was like hey you're doing this uh they're not gonna listen but Isaiah volunteered and um yeah he had kind of had like the I will go and do mentality and then um, Jeremiah. Can I pause you right there yeah. again? I ask you a question about Isaiah. And maybe you're asking this question too. So what was his, what was Isaiah's initial reaction to his calling? He, he was like, well, he volunteered for it too. So it wasn't just like, but he was like excited, I guess. What, what was his initial feeling? You said he was small. He said, yeah, yeah. What was he realized, his concern? Um, well, it's, it just says that he was forgiven of his sins. So, and I'm assuming that God knew that he was worried about like being sinful and not like living up to the task. Exactly. That's exactly what it was. Like yeah. it was, it's like, okay, but I'm not worthy to do, to do this, to bear this message. Mm -hmm. I'm not your guy. <laughs> And so the Lord responded to that, with helping him understand that he is clean, that he is forgiven. Um, so with Jeremiah, the Lord appeared to him and told him that before he was born, he was chosen to be a prophet. And uh, it kind of talks about how he didn't feel worthy of this calling, and he kind of expresses his concern to to Jesus and he he also said that he was like a child and he could not speak so he must have just like not been good at like public speaking or maybe he just wasn't very like good with his words and the Lord told him uh, not to worry about the words because he would he would put the words in his mouth and um, that was pretty much all there was for Jeremiah I think. Yep. Yeah, that's a lot. That's a lot there. So do you have a do you have a verse? Do you have the verses written down in your Yeah. Thing? So Jeremiah one four why through nine. Why don't we read we got a second here. Let, okay. Let's let's open that up and read Jeremiah's response. Everybody. So we're in uh Jeremiah, which is near the end of the Old Testament. Jeremiah what? Jeremiah 1 through 9. Okay. Do you want me to read that? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, uh, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest out of the womb, I sanctified thee. And I ordained thee a prophet out of the nations, unto the nations. Uh, then said I, Ah, Lord, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. So, so his concern is, like you said, he's concerned about speaking, mm -hmm. and he feels very, very like unprepared. Yeah. Um, maybe you could say he was shy. Maybe that was one of his concerns. Yeah. Um, the Lord said, "Be not afraid of their faces, for I am the, I am with thee to deliver thee," saith the Lord. 
Then the Lord put his put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. So he was afraid of the people. And, and the Lord's response was, hey, uh, which, and you didn't read verse 7, says, don't say I'm a child, and you will go wherever I send you, and you will speak whatever I tell you to speak. So he gives him confidence. He's like, don't worry. I'm going to tell you where to go. I'm going to tell you what to say. And then he touches his lips and makes him, and puts his uh, word in his mouth, essentially. So he knows he has confidence. Hmm. Well, see, I'm going to let you finish, and then maybe we'll circle back and get some more of these little yeah. lessons here. Um, so for Moses, I thought it was interesting because it starts out and it says that Moses found himself on the top of a mountain, which is interesting because it's like you don't often just kind of like find yourself on the top of a mountain. It's not like something that happens on accident. But um, so he was on the top of the mountain, and he saw the face of God. It says he saw God face to face meaning he was transfigured um, because it, well, it later goes on to talk about how um, he realized that if he was in his like regular human form that he would not have been able to survive like seeing God. And um, God then told him that he was similar to his only begotten son, which was another thing that like stood out to me because it was like, I, it was just like, uh, God was reminded of his own son through Moses, which would be pretty cool to have God say that to you. Um, he then told him that he had work for him to do, and then God revealed to Moses uh, the end of the earth and all the children of men that have walked on the earth. Um, after God left, it took a few hours for Moses to be able to like stand back up, and then when he was able to, everything was put in perspective by the things that God revealed to him. Um, then, like right after that happened, Satan appeared to him and told him to follow him instead. But having just experienced like the full glory of God, Moses wasn't really impressed. And he was like, wait a second, I had to be transfigured in order to see God. But you're just appearing to me like, like any other normal person. So that's not really like the same power. So I'm not going to follow you. Um, and then... Abraham, out of all of them, is probably my favorite because um, I believe he was like, he and his brother, I think we're, I don't remember exactly why, but him and his brother were saying a prayer, and during the prayer, uh, they he had a vision where God told him of his plan for him, and the Lord describes the power, the, like, Jesus describes his own power to Abraham, which is also pretty cool, and then he tells him, um, all the blessings that he will receive by following the commandments he's given. And then Abraham was like thankful to receive the instructions and he got up from his prayer and started doing what the Lord asked him to do. So with that one, it was like, he said the prayer, just expecting like to say a prayer. And then he experienced this like awesome vision. And then as soon as he gets up, he's like, okay, let's like start getting the work on this one. Like do what I need to get done. And then the last one is Enoch. Um, Enoch had the Spirit of God descend upon him, and he told him to, prop, uh, to prophesy unto the people to repent because God was angry with the evilness of them. Um, Enoch asks God why he chose him. He tells God that he is but a lad, and the people hate him because he's slow of speech, which um, it was kind of interesting because it actually said that the people hated him in the scripture, which I thought like usually it's like some fancier way of saying that like I'm not in favor with the people, but I'm Enoch popular. But Enoch was just like the people hate me. Like <laughs> and then um and he was all he also said he was slow of speech, uh, similar to Jeremiah. And God replies and tells Enoch to go forth and do as he was commanded, and his mouth shall be filled with the words. With, uh, with God's words, uh, for he is in his hand and he will do good with like whatever. God basically told him like, you're mine and I'm choosing you. So even if you don't feel like you can do it, I'm not gonna make something like bad 
you know, like I'm gonna do good with you. Um, God then told him to put clay on his eyes, and when he did, he beheld the spirits that God had created and other things that the natural eye couldn't see. Um, and then it talks about how God made him a seer, which I think there's a lot more into that than just like what was like stated, but um, I just thought that was cool because it just showed how like God sometimes uses like things that we wouldn't normally see as like anything special and then it like makes us, I don't know, he uses things around us that we don't see as special to do his work. So, um, and at that point, Enoch went forth and testified of the Lord. So that's all I have as far as like the initial lesson goes. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Oh, so of all of those things, Grant, what um, personal message collectively do you get for you from having studied these experiences? And everybody else think about the same question. Okay, we've heard like 10 different ways that, that the Lord has called um, his prophets or apostles or disciples. What do we find in common? Um, and what lesson is there in that for you and for me, but for you personally? And I'm going to start with you, Grant, and then we'll take. Well, it just shows like, for me, it kind of showed me that it's not like, I don't think any of these people like did what they were doing with the intention of having God, like, like having a vision. So, and that kind of shows that it's like, you don't need to like do, you don't need to try to have a vision or like try to like have some amazing experience. If you just do what you've been asked and commanded to, and you put yourself in the right circumstances that God wants you to be in and, and you follow the spirit and what you're commanded to do. If you just do the, the basic things that you've been told to do, then that's when these visions have happened. And when, I mean, Moses was just on the top of a mountain and then all of a sudden he was transfigured and like, you don't need to, yeah, I don't need to do all the extras and like, just mm -hmm. do what you've been told yeah. and that's enough. Okay. So they, did they start out prophets? No. <laughs> did they start out apostles? Obviously not, right? They, they weren't aspiring. They didn't say, oh, I want to be the next prophet. I'm going to be this guy's right hand man, says Peter. Right? So none of them started out as what they would become. They all started out very normal, regular, even having a low opinion of themselves. Being very unpopular, unknowledgeable, uh, unprepared, lacking confidence in that calling. They didn't go in trying to get a calling. They were just, like you said, Grant, living their good life, doing what they could to, to be their best. And even then, not all of them were. Some of them had to be called to start doing better before they could be called to be the prophet. Um, I want, I want to, but let me take a couple of comments if you have any. Asher, you were going to raise a hand, and then if anybody else, what does this, what personal message does this do? These callings, these stories have for you. Yeah. based on that person's needs. So, so the way he called them, you're saying the way he called them probably pertained to them. I mean, I don't know how they were thinking, but I assume that he call them in a way that would pay more to them but also he, whether it was a vision or whether it was like yeah. come and see where i but stay mostly or he addressed almost he addressed the concerns of them when calling him like a lot of them were like oh people don't like me uh -huh. i can't speak well it's like oh well i can help you with that yes yeah don't worry about that don't worry about your inadequacy don't worry about all that you're not yet of course you're not what you're supposed to be yet but don't worry about all that because I will help you to become what I need you to become. If you feel stressed out about the future and the future responsibilities that we laid upon your shoulders and you want to do like 
who's the guy that went and sat by the river for like seven days, right? It's like, I'd rather take it easy, thanks anyway. Um, I'd rather go for the easy life. Uh, like there is more to life than just trying to have a good time and go the easy way. You never become what you're meant to become by taking it easy and trying to have fun. That will never get you where the Lord wants you to be. Um, any other comments, personal messages from the callings of prophets and apostles? Um, Moses' first experience was with the burning bush, wasn't it? He was out in the desert. And what did he, the Lord, tell him through that experience, the message that he got? Does anybody know? Take the shoes off your feet because you're standing on holy ground. So the first thing that Moses was asked to do was to take spiritual things seriously. To not, to respect the space between him and God, that it was a special sacred space. And to not treat lightly or to dismiss or make common that which is uncommon and that which is sacred. I mean, that was the first thing that Moses was asked to do, to teach him, to get from where he was to the next step closer, is to treat important things with importance treat spiritual things with respect and reverence um anyway there's a lot in there thank you so much for sharing those for preparing appreciate your time and and you guys did a great job and that's all we have time for so love you guys and uh, the lord loves you leave this with you in the name of jesus christ amen jake that's right jake jake we're just in time to say the closing prayer. Heavenly Father, I'm so grateful that we're able to come to seminary today and that we're able to learn and, and uh, see the experiences and, and the teachings from our peers and that we're able to take away and apply some spiritual meaning into our lives and understand why the prophets are called and the importance of them and please bless that we'll be able to have a safe rest of our day and be able to get back to the school. And I say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thanks.